Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetic Dojo. I'm Gary Machuda. It's great to be with you. And, uh, folks, uh, it's it's always fun to talk about apologetics and just, you know, b- being Catholic in general. And uh, you're probably wondering, for those watching live stream, I'm, I'm wearing an ELO T-shirt because I went to their concert uh, last Saturday and I have to tell you, it was a beautiful concert. When was the last time you ever heard a rock concert be described as beautiful? But uh, the musicianship and uh, the light show, it, it was a thing of beauty. It actually moved me to tears. And it actually helped me you know, praise God for the incredible talents and technology and uh, just you know, showing his beauty through creative things. And that's kind of the thing for this show. Believe it or not, because in Philippians 4, 8, Paul says this, and this is important for us. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. You know, this is, uh, being Catholic is more than um, just going to church on Sundays. It's about loving God, worshiping God, and bringing God to other people, you know. And and to do that, we have to, you know, we, we have to see God in whatever is true, whatever is beautiful, whatever is lovely, even secular things. And, uh, and kind of have that uh, all-embracing vision of life. So, okay, what does this have to do with apologetics? Well, you know, that is the glue that we can go to people outside the church and, uh, you know, appeal to the truths and the beauties and, and things that are lovely to draw them closer to God. And that also includes beautiful intellectual arguments. So we're for our guest, uh, we have a special guest today. He is Pat Flynn of the Pat Flynn Show. And that's kind of his specialty. He is a, uh, a person that embraces all that's good. And in his podcast, he exhorts people to be the best they can be, you know, to accomplish in any field, music, uh, weightlifting, um, business, uh, authorship, things like that. You know, he exhorts people to excellence, and he's also a convert. Uh, in fact, uh, Pat Flynn at one time lost his faith in God. He was a, a studied atheist, and uh, through his studies, um, he came not only back to Uh, theism, but also to Catholicism. So he's coming up on the other side of the first break. And as always, uh, we're going to have our Finding the Fallacy, which today's Finding the Fallacy is the Moving the Goalpost Fallacy. And we're also going to meet the early church father, who is Papias. So cool stuff ahead of us today. And and I want to thank everybody for joining us. I guess it's time for our shout-outs. Yes, to... Uh, give our little hat tip to the uh, social media section of the dojo. I want to welcome everybody from watching uh, and uh, live stream, social media, YouTube, Facebook. Hello, everybody. Great to see you. <laughs> All right. Got a musical emoji explosion going on on YouTube. Uh, and thank you for listening on radio and possibly through a podcast. Uh, great to have you as well. If you want to have a question for perhaps Pat Flynn or uh, just anything in general, give us a call, 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Or you can always send your questions or maybe you want to just share what's going on with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, your own life. Just send us an email and that will go to questions at handsonapologetics.com. Questions at handsonapologetics.com. Love to hear from you. And um, let's see, we, I think we did all the housekeeping stuff for the program. Let, why don't we jump into our Finding the Fallacy, shall we? And the Finding the Fallacy is moving the goalposts fallacy. 
and the moving the goalpost fallacy is an informal fallacy uh, in which evidence is presented in response to a specific claim and is dis- dismissed and some other often greater evidence is demanded. That is, after an attempt has been made to score a goal, so to speak, the goalposts are moved so as to exclude the attempt. Now, as little kids, I'm sure we, our brothers or sisters <laughs> have done this to us. But, yeah, it's also a logical fallacy, folks. And this occurs an awful lot in dialogue where uh, someone will say, well, you know, uh, such and such is true and I won't believe otherwise unless you could show me. And then you show them, and then what they do is they, they will move the goalposts. They'll say, well, no, no, what you need to show is something much greater, something higher. And usually, I mean, almost sometimes to the extent that it's impossible to prove a point. So that's moving the goalpost fallacy. So uh, what you need to do is point it out when they do that. You know, um, if you satisfy a criteria or a criterion that they put down, and they move the goalposts, say, hold on a second. You know, what are we talking about here? Why was this, why did you say this would satisfy you? And then when I fulfilled that, you changed the rules, you know? Explain what's going on here. Let's define terms. Because usually what happens is moving the goalpost fallacy, uh, what's underneath that is usually they're changing the definition of terms. So you need to anchor those down, folks, to avoid this fallacy. All right, enough of the finding of fallacy. Let's jump into the Meet the Early Church Father for today, who is a very interesting, although cryptic father, known as Papias. And uh, sometimes I hear it pronounced Papias, but I prefer Papias. St. Papias flourished sometime around AD 130. He was a bishop of Hierapolis in Asia Minor, which is uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, And according to uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, he was not only a friend of Polycarp of Smyrna, who was a disciple of St. John, but he was also a hearer of the Apostle John. Now, uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyon is a very early witness, folks. He wrote roughly around 180 A.D. Okay, so, uh, and he also was a disciple or a hearer of Polycarp. So that's pretty strong testimony. Now, so you have Irenaeus on one side. And then later on, you have the first uh, chronicler of church history, Eusebius. And Eusebius points out, however, that uh, the quote that Irenaeus gives, uh, it's clear that Papias uh, was not a hearer directly of the apostles, but was a hearer of the acquaintances of the apostles, which would mean he would be a disciple of Polycarp, but not necessarily St. John. Okay. So there's a tendency, so you have, okay, so you have a more um, uh, early, more conservative view in Irenaeus, which is very early on. Then a couple centuries later, you have a more critical uh, examination by Eusebius. Okay. Most scholars side with Eusebius, and they uh, pretty much say, well, yeah, actually he, uh, uh, Papias probably shouldn't be considered an apostolic father, because he wrote, uh, you know, he his contact with the apostles was merely through their disciples. So, you know, those are the two extremes, folks, in regards to Papias. Uh, he wrote a, a large work, and only one work, by the way, called The Explanation of the Sayings of the Lord. Again, roughly around 130. Uh, Eusebius says that Papias, as is clear in his books, uh, the man had very little intelligence. <laughs> So, again, you know, Eusebius uh, doesn't pull punches, uh, and uh, so he he kind of gives his opinion. And like I said, it's kind of a skeptical opinion. Uh, He says there's no doubt because uh, uh, Papias was Achilles. In other words, he believed in a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ, which was a belief that uh, some people in early church had, but largely, like you can see with Eusebius, they were kind of looked out as kind of wackos. So uh, uh, Papias apparently held that view, and Eusebius kind of looks down his nose at Papias for that. Uh, Eusebius uh, accepts approvingly Irenaeus' testimony that the five books of his explanations is the sole literary endeavor of Papias, and certainly no further writings of Papias has ever come to light. So basically, this is the work. Now, unfortunately, 
as with the case with many extremely early Christian writings, uh, the originals get lost. Okay. However, portions of what he wrote is perce- is preserved as quotations within Eusebius' church history. So uh, that's another tip for you apologists out there. Uh, pick up a copy, if you don't have it, of Eusebius' church history. It's a fascinating read uh, because he ha- he uh, was in touch with some of the early sources. Many of them are lost, and he preserves them in his writings. So uh, there's lots of early church fathers that we would have nothing uh, of their writings had it not been for Eusebius copiously uh, copying things. So just FYI for those who are getting into apologetics, starting to read the early church fathers. So what do these fragments talk about? Well, it talks about uh, some of the Gospels. For example, uh, Papias says that when Mark, Mark became the interpreter of St. Peter, and he wrote down accurately what he had remembered, uh, though not in order, and of the words and deeds of the Lord. Uh, he was neither here nor a follower of the Lord, but such he was afterwards, as I say, of Peter. He had no intention of giving a connected account of the sayings of the Lord, but adapted his instructions uh, as necessary. Uh, Mark then made no mistake, but he wrote down what he had remembered him, and he made it uh, his concern to omit nothing that he heard, nor falsify anything therein. So that's what Papias has to say about the Gospel of Mark. He also makes a comment about Matthew, which is also kind of interesting. He says, Matthew indeed composed the sayings in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them to the best of their ability. So very cool stuff from our Meet the Early Church. Father today, Papias of Herapolis. Coming up on the other side of the break, master apologist and master of pretty much anything, Pat Flynn is joining us to talk about his journey to the faith. Stay tuned, everybody. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics. This is Terry Barber reminding you, there's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking about true femininity, be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
apologetics, and we are going to talk about uh, conversion to the Catholic faith uh, with a fellow who I'm going to be working with, along with uh, John DeRosa of ClassicalTheism.com. Uh, We're going to give a live YouTube event on August 21st titled Catholic Apologetics in the 21st Century. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to give you more details as uh, the event comes up, but nevertheless, uh all three of us are going to be on that live broadcast, and I should introduce our guest. Our guest is Pat Flynn. Pat Flynn uh, runs the Pat Flynn Show, which is an incredibly popular uh, uh, podcast ministry. covers everything from fitness to mental health to business to writings, philosophy, theology. You get the tools to become someone who performs, outsmarts, and outmaneuvers the pack. Uh, he gives hands-on tools, tips, tactics to pursue your most f- fulfilling life. And that also includes not only just the stuff of the world, like you know, uh, being a fitness coach, musician, entrepreneur, things like that, but also theology. So, Pat Flynn, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Okay, well, they, with a build-up like that, you expect that there would be a technical glitch. But we're, we're getting Pat back on the, the air. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of our theme, you know, uh, for this broadcast is to embrace everything that's that's good, that's true, that's lovely, that's beautiful. And, you know, we could always critique uh, the things that aren't. But I think it's important to also have a positive uh, outlook on the world as well because after all how can we reach people outside the church if we can't appeal to these things so uh let yeah okay why don't i talk a little bit about that uh live the live show that we're going to have on october uh, not october august 21st uh it's going to be on youtube like i said uh john de rosa of classical theism is going to be there and also pat flynn of the pat flynn show is going to be and we're going to give a uh a 90-minute d- defense course, uh, apologetics training. The dojo is going to go live that day, and uh, all three of us are going to tackle the whole issue of how to explain defend the faith in the modern world. But without further ado, uh, let's talk to our guest, Pat Flynn. Welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Oh, Gary, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, hey, the pleasure is all ours because... Uh, Man, you uh, you are such an interesting individual. I mean, <laughs> so you're an oh, author. You. You're an author. You're a fitness coach. You're a musician. You're an entrepreneur. Uh, you like everything. <laughs> well, I yes, I am a self-proclaimed, and let's underline that word, generalist. So I, I, I try to be good to great, or at least fairly competent at a at a wide range of of things. That's 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 sort of my my shtick it's worked pretty well so far and uh yeah that's um i think it helps to to give you a a wider perspective on on a lot of different areas of life and can allow you to synthesize and and analyze i think it's especially useful for philosophy and and theology as well but uh, i have successfully avoided being the best in the world at any one thing and definitely (laughs) i wish i could say that was on purpose but mostly it's just due to my inherent limitations (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I appreciate that because uh, now it's confession time. For me, I like to dig into the weeds, you know, go deep, drill down super deep in like one issue. And uh, often, you know, that's so limiting. And uh, you, you really do kind of lose a perspective. It's much better to be uh, uh, maybe not an expert in everything, but know, you know, be competent in a lot of things rather than just one narrow field. Yeah, and I, I think there's definitely a balance. I mean, there's there's areas of my life where I, I feel like I really did try to go to the end of the rainbow. So I hesitate to promote this idea of jack of all trades, master of none. I think you can I think you can achieve mastery in a number of areas, but you you should probably or might have to give up trying to be number 1 or best in the world. I think that is where the downside is for a lot of people if you try to hardcore lifelong specialize in one area i think that people can can that that becomes a snare in a lot of different ways not just thinking but even even business success fitness success i I think that that idea of lifelong specialization is, is often very limiting but at the same time i think i think we all have enough time in our 
in our existence here on Earth, that, that we can dive deep, significantly deep in a number of areas, even if we don't just limit ourselves to just any one area for the rest of our lives. Yeah, yeah, very good. And uh, so uh, part of that, uh, that whole generalist outlook uh, involves uh, questions about God. And I'd love to hear your story, because I heard little bits and pieces of it, but I never heard the whole thing. Uh, tell us a little bit about, like, uh, you know, how you grew up. Uh, were you Catholic? Uh, well, yeah, so I was baptized Catholic. Um, very okay. nominal, you know, Christer family. You know, Christmas and Easter, we'd go to Mass, like, <laughs> if the grandparents were in town, you know. Yeah. Um, so... So I was technically, I often call myself a convert, but I, I really have to remind myself, I am technically a revert. <laughs> so okay. was baptized Catholic, um, but my, my faith fell, fell away at a pretty early age, really, really sort of early, early middle school. And, and, and it all happened in a very crude and unfortunate way. Um, I, just, I just remember sitting in fifth grade science class and hearing about the Big Bang, and, and the thought initially kind of popped into my head of thinking, well, this isn't, you know, what I was taught in Sunday school in the second grade, like that, like wasn't like that isn't in the Bible anywhere. And, and that was just the first sort of seed of doubt that um, I never really got a good answer to. And part of that is my fault. I never I never really went looking for the answers initially. And a lot of my friends and their families weren't religious. So I, I can't say I was entirely interested in even pursuing, you know, I never even really, you know, as a kid, I always saw having to, to go to church as a tedious thing anyway. So there was some an emotional leaning against religion at that point in my life anyways. But then a, a little bit later, Gary, I, I always had a love for, for writing and music or sort of my artistic backgrounds growing up. I, I read Charlotte's Web in the second grade. And I just I just fell in love with, with writing and writers. And, and, and probably around late middle school, early high school, I discovered a writer. Um, many people have forgotten him, but he was quite prominent back in his day. His name's H.L. Mencken. And yeah. he, he's an atheist. Some would call him yes. one of the old atheists. And right. his, his prose style is still incredibly interesting. He's a really funny guy, very polemic writer. Um, but he's now, when was this about? Uh, this, How old this was going Probably like the eighth grade, ninth grade, something, something wow. around that time period. Yeah. And I, I, it's, <laughs> it's all funny when you trace it back because, I, because I've been asked so much of my, my sort of origin story. That I've, I've gone back and like, yeah, how did all this happen? And I really, <laughs> he, was kind of, he was kind of the first figure. And I just heard it. I just found out about him because he was mentioned in some writing books that I was reading. And I, I looked him up and I was absorbed by his, his style. And uh, he was he was an atheist and, and a very polemic atheist. He was kind of the Christopher Hitchens of the olden years, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, and and he really kind of passed me off in, in, into the into, you know, Nietzsche and Sartre and Russell and Camus and all these old atheistic thinkers. And I was always very interested or I maybe plagued by the big existential questions. You know, I, I always wanted to know, like, what what's really going on here? What is this experience of of existence and, and life? So I so I was always very curious. And it seemed like these people had a worldview. And it seemed like these people were really smart as well. And, I, of course, I wanted to be a smart person. I wanted to sound like I knew what I was talking about. And there was also, it, you know, not to, not to psychoanalyze myself too much, but there's something about an adolescent rebellion going on, you know, kind of being edgy, or, you know, and sure. embracing this, this atheistic worldview. So, so that I really steeped myself in, in sort of the, the old atheist for, uh, for many years. Um, really took them seriously, really, really tried to build out a, a worldview um, from the sort of physicalist or metaphysical naturalist position. And uh, long story short, we can go into more details here if, if, it's, if it interests anybody, but, but all of it ultimately collapsed. You know, if you, I think if you try to follow the starting point through, as so many of these thinkers did, you just wind up in a swamp of absurdities that, that I just really could not accept. So I guess the funny thing is, is what, what ultimately brought me out of, out of my, my atheism wasn't necessarily running into any smart religious thinkers, not at first, but it was just going deeper and trying to be more consistent with the worldview and having it collapse like a cheap cardboard house. That I just came to this point where I just, this this cannot be right. This, this can't, like, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm reading the old atheists and many of the new ones, too. Like, like, you know, good thinkers, smart people, people like Alex Rosenberg, 
um, who start from, from the premise that, that only physical things exist, we're all fermions and bosons and nothing more, and then you have to go on to deny pretty much every fundamental feature of, of human experience, from morality to meaning to truth, and of course even consciousness, even, even ourselves. So I just, I just felt like it was more obvious that, that I actually exist. <laughs> <laughs> But that, that seemed more clearly true to me than the fact that I don't exist or the fact nope. that fermions and bosons exist. And I just thought I have to go back and just reevaluate everything. So that was kind of where the, where the turning point was for me. <laughs> right. Now, did they actually tease out the implications of their teachings or did they, was it up to you to kind of connect the dots? Oh no! Um, they actually were really helpful. So I brought up Rosenberg. He's got a he's got a wonderful book. I actually recommend people read it. It's called The Atheist Guide to Reality, and oh, he yeah. a, and the, the reason I like him is because I think he is willing to be consistent. Where a lot of the new atheists, they kind of, you know, they they go over to their Christian neighbor and and borrow a, a couple scoops of their worldview to help support their foundations for morality here or there or, or meaning or consciousness. Rogan, Rosenberg doesn't do any of that. So, you know, through his book, he just systematically drives to pretty much all of the conclusions that I just talked about that, hey, you know, <laughs> we can't get consciousness from, from purely dumb matter. So consciousness doesn't exist. It's, it's an illusion, which, of course, raises all the difficulties you classically hear of, well, who's having the illusion and so on and so forth. But <laughs> I think that, that right. both, the, and you see this more in the old atheists, but there, there are many good contemporary atheistic thinkers that really do drive all the way through. And when I engaged with them and I saw that, and I, and I really saw that they were just being consistent, um, rather than embracing those conclusions, I, I figured, well, maybe I should just go and re-examine my starting point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You check your math, you know. <laughs> if, it, if it ends up annihilating <laughs> all of existence, so something went wrong earlier on. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, now, but, but was it, this, it, uh, did the New Atheist come out around this time, or was this uh, after uh, that? You know, that no, they, they, yeah, they were around definitely during this time. Um, okay. I, I have to say that even even when I would have considered myself an atheist, I, I was never over much impressed with any of the New Atheists. Yeah. Um, they just they just sort of seem to to lack a, and when I, I mean like the the, the 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 very polemic ones the Dawkins and the Hitchens and the and the Harris. Uh, there's there's some people who I suppose would call themselves new atheists. That I think are a bit more rigorous, but sort of the mainstream ones. I always they always just seem to to lack the the intellectual rigor and consistency that that the many of the old atheists had. Like the, people like Mackey or or Russell uh, or even contemporaries like like Rosenberg. Um, and, and certainly, you know, however accomplished and intelligent they are in their certain fields, um, I certainly don't question people like Dawkins' credibility in biology. Whenever they start to speculate in matters of philosophy and theology, they always just, you know, come off deeply confused. And it's not just theists that, that accuse them of this. I think it was philosopher Michael Roos, who, who himself is an atheist, said that Dawkins' book, God's Reason, made him embarrassed just to be an atheist. So they, they well, hold it right there while you have the music. Listen to Hands On Apologetics. This is Terry Barber reminding you there's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking about true femininity. Be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. Uh, yeah, sorry, Pat, the uh, the hard break kind of snuck up on us, but uh, right before the break you were talking about how you start seeing the implications of some of these atheistic uh, authors that you were thinking about studying. And uh, I mean, we brought up the new atheist, and you're right, a lot of uh, even atheists themselves uh, criticized the new atheist for kind of just being, I guess, pop atheism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very petulant, I think, is also the word. Um, so, and not <laughs> to say that they don't have anything interesting to say, uh, but there's, you know, there's, there is a deep intellectual rigor uh, to 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 atheism that I think is just just very missed. If those are the only people, the only atheists that that anybody ever reads, so I I often encourage you know my friends or people I talk to who are atheists who who are quoting Dawkins. I, I like to tell well hey go go read the Miracle of Theism by Mackey and then let's have the conversation again at another point. I think it'll at least increase in quality if nothing else. Yeah, make them into a good atheist and then uh, then you can interact with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So but, you, know, you couldn't. A lot of value. Oh, go ahead. Yep. So I'm, I'm sorry. I was just saying there was a lot of value, at least my time spent in that world, because it really helped me to to understand it and and to yeah. and to be able to engage. It's helped me to engage with people who are skeptical, agnostic, or, or atheistic, because I spent so much time in that in that worldview myself. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So what do you th- why do you suppose? I know we've gone a little off track, but this has always been a question of mine. Uh, why don't people follow uh, the arguments to their ultimate conclusion? Why do they stop? I mean, you came to the point where you saw nihilism on the other side of the horizon, and that was a pill you couldn't swallow. But w- what prevents people from getting to that point? Oh, boy. Well, that's that's a question I, I may have a few speculations on, and that's, that's all they are is, is speculations. Um, because, you know... I, I, I don't think it's hard. I really don't think it's difficult to see the implications that are, that are drawn out from an atheistic worldview. Um, but I think I think a lot of it has to do with with people just kind of, that, especially today, they use a very idiosyncratic definition of, of atheism. They just they just think that it, it just describes their psychological belief state. They think that oh well you know atheism you know, we have no burden of proof because we're not making a claim. We just don't believe in the existence of God. And that, that certainly isn't where I was coming from as an atheist. I, you know, I was, I was, I wanted, because that's, that's almost trivial. It's, a, you know, great. I like blueberry yogurt. And we can just keep making a catalog of our personal preferences and beliefs. But, you know, I wanted to know, like, what is actually going on? What, what is true? Do we have reason to believe that God exists or God doesn't exist? And if God doesn't exist, what does that mean? What does that tell us about the world? What reasons do I think or what evidence do I have for for arguing God's non-existence? And then what are the consequences of that? So I think that's part of the problem is the way that atheism is presented today kind of leans more toward an agnosticism. And to the extent that happens, I would say it's mostly uninteresting. It's it's pretty boring. It doesn't it doesn't tell you much about anything except for what that per, what that particular person happens to believe at the time. But to the extent that that you you want a little bit more, uh, you you really want to try and find some degree of intellectual satisfaction, then atheism does make claims about the world. You know, the, the, when you make the claim that God does not exist, you do have a burden of proof, and you do have to try to give reasons for why you believe that and then and then once you are trying to establish a world view i think the implications do fall out pretty rapidly i mean once you understand that that, that there's a sort of a qualitative abyss between pure dumb physical stuff fermions and bosons and the unity and transparency of consciousness it just seems absurd that you could ever get consciousness 
from fermions and bosons, at least in the materialistic conception. So, so I don't think it, it is difficult to, to draw out these implications. I, just, I guess my first thing I would say about this, without being too long-winded, is people just, the way they use atheism now, I think, is more in terms of describing their, their personal subjective state of mind rather than trying to establish a consistent and coherent worldview. Okay, yeah. Now, that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, so you, uh, you saw the ends of atheism. Uh, why, why not just kind of uh, park in the, uh, you know, the, the warm, fuzzy world of agnosticism or, you know, somewhere where you could kind of say, well, something exists, but we'll never know about it. Um, what, what moved well, you to start I, studying theism, in other words? It, yeah, it's, it is interesting. And I kind of I moved through a couple different, you know, I can't, I certainly dabbled with agnosticism. I, you know, there are times when I thought, like, can, can, can we really know? Is it even possible to know? So, so that is something that I, that I wrestled with for, for a while. And uh, I also spent, you know, as I kind of moved through my intellectual journey to the Catholic Church, I even spent some time with religious pluralism, thinking that all religions were, like, wrong in a sense, but right in another sense. You know, they're all kind of just pointing to some transcendent reality, you know, along the lines of, Aldous Huxley and his book, Perennial Philosophy, and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, what, what I decided to do is kind of get out of my little bubble as a specialist in atheism, right? And here's yeah. kind of the idea of generalism. And I'm like, well, let's just go back and study these classic thinkers that, um, you know, I, I kind of held a sort of chronological condescension to, you know, like, oh, they're old. What, you know, what, what did those poor guys, they probably didn't know much, um, <laughs> And I think, unfortunately, we see a lot of that today, and I, I, I suffered from that as well. But then I went back, you know, to Plato, Aristotle, Boethius, Augustine, and just kind of like went up the line. And by the, by the time I got to Thomas Aquinas and his contemporaries, people like Adler and Lonergan and actually Ed Fazer, too, who you recently had on, on oh, your yeah. show, was a, was, was a huge influence to me. Um, things just really started to snap into place. I mean, the, the, the rigor... The, the coherency of their arguments, uh, how, how theism and specifically classical theism made sense of the world in a way that, that no other worldview seemed to be capable of. Uh, you know, gradually, it wasn't an, an overnight thing. It's not like any one argument got me. It was sort of a cumulative force that, you know, over, over a period of time moved me into both the, the sort of I, I often say I was I was really a Thomist before I was even a Catholic <laughs> into, the, into the into the classical theistic position, yeah. and then from there I had I had this sort of once I feel like I kind of had my philosophy straight, that's when I started to take the religious questions seriously. Okay, like it seems like this this you know some religion might actually be true, so so maybe I should start to look into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, did you just run down to the corner and go to confession and? You're back in a Catholic church, but uh, yeah. So you, there's still a long way to go, isn't there? Yeah. Well, the funny the funny thing is, is you know when you when you're kind of steeped um, in in so many thinkers that that I was. I mean, and you know, and and many of my friends were. You, know, you kind of attract similar people to yourself. Um, very skeptical. So so I assumed a, a pretty deep anti-Catholic bias. I mean, uh, there's there's. <laughs> nothing quite as bad as, as the Catholic Church when you're coming from an atheistic worldview. I mean, it's just it's just it's just this tyrannical force, right? So so even when I was encountering these these great Catholic thinkers and they really impressed me, there was just there was something there there was a, this animus that was just stuck on me uh, against the Catholic Church. So even when I started considering the question of, of Christ and seeing if there was a plausible case to be made for the, the divinity of Christ as God's only Son, uh, I actually started attending Protestant churches first before I before I um, became or re-entered the, the Catholic Church just because I was just and same thing with my wife. She went through her own conversion experience, and there was a, a point where. Um, you know, we were going to a sort of, we were bouncing back and forth between Lutheran and, and evangelical churches, and she, she, she literally said, pardon the language, she's just like, okay, I, I'll consider becoming a Christian, but no way in hell am I ever becoming a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, she, she actually, she actually just got confirmed this year. So, <laughs> she's, she's yeah, famous last words, huh? On, 
but all that. But uh, but it, it kind of gives you a perspective of, of where sure. we were, were coming from. So that, so that was the last move move that I made. Is um, and you know I'm happy to un- unpack any of the particular details. But you know once I got to to seeing that there was a really good case to be made for the resurrection and the truth of Christianity in general. I could not make sense of sola scriptura. The, the whole thing of going by the Bible alone seemed entirely circular. It just seemed like a complete non-starter. And it seemed to me pretty obvious that, uh, that, that Christ really did leave us with a church that's hierarchical, visible, unified, sacramental. And the, the only way that I think I could make a, a coherent argument for, for, and I was still looking for, a, I always thought, Gary, that if, you know, if it's true, it should be true all the way through. I shouldn't have to hit some arbitrary stopping point where I just throw my hands up and say, well, the Bible says so, or because it's in the Bible. I should be able to, to argue it from start to finish. And I came to a point where it seemed like the only way I would be able to do that is through something like the authority of the Catholic Church, that Christ left us with a church, not a book, and that church, through its authority, would have the ability to say what should be included in Scripture and what shouldn't. Uh, so uh, through wrestling with that, uh, I, yeah, I finally wound back up in the confessional, ultimately. <laughs> yeah. No, that that's a really good point, that, you know, if anything's true, it should be true throughout. So it should be coherent throughout, and it should also have, like, universal applicability right or explanatory power it shouldn't come to a point where well that's what the bible says right and 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 unfortunately you know i was trying to make the protestant position work i i I really was you know there's there was a lot that that attracted me initially uh in that direction but i I came up i really came up against great catholics (laughs) really arguing making the old jesuit critique saying hey you know guess what scripture can't interpret itself. Scripture can't tell you what should be included in Scripture. Scripture can't provide you the answers to how you should apply the lessons in Scripture to the to to a modern day context. And then, of course, there's the classic one of there's nothing even in Scripture that says you should go by Scripture alone. So it doesn't even seem to meet its own standard. And uh, yeah, it really was coming up against smart uh, Catholics and and Catholic objections that I I just really didn't feel like I could overcome without an enormous amount of mental contortions, which which didn't seem right and were never really fully satisfying to me, that again made me take seriously the possibility that maybe maybe Catholicism's true. Maybe the <laughs> maybe that <laughs> visible church is actually God's church, wouldn't you know? <laughs> yeah, very good. Well we'll talk with Pat Flynn about his journey of faith, uh, the host of Pat Flynn Show. More to come on the other side of the break, folks. Stay tuned. Listen to Hands-On Apologetics. This is Terry Barber reminding you there's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking about true femininity. Be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with uh, Pat Flynn of the Pat Flynn Show, and he's describing his, uh, his inversion, or uh, I got reversion, I should say, uh, back to <laughs> Catholicism from atheism. Yeah, I know. There's so many isms out there. Or ist. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, you know, Pat, uh, one thing I, I was, boy, I wish we uh, had a couple of shows. There's so many things I'd love to drill down with you. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I I would like to move the story from uh, you know you coming back to the church to your current ministry because uh, I, I could, that was a juncture in my life where uh, I found uh, discovered apologetics was I just got out of school I went to my first full time job and I, and I was ready to climb up the corporate ladder right so I figured well I might as well mm-hmm. start improving my life you know learning different languages. Maybe trying to be more holy, you know, <laughs> because, uh, you know, it, my life's kind of like on track now. And uh, it was really that when I discovered apologetics and, you know, it just took over my life. So, uh, you know, explain once you came back to the church, like, how did you get into the line of work that you're in now? Well, I've, so I've been running my own my own online business and I've been writing books for a number of years. So I've, I've okay. accumulated something of a, you know, of a, of a platform and, and followers, you know, on my podcast, on, on my blog. And, and a lot of it always had to do with, with fitness and business. But, you know, I was always interested in exploring other ideas as well. And, um, you know, as soon as somebody goes through a conversion experience, I mean, it just it just turns you inside out. I mean, I think that's the, the, the sort of beauty and the and the just absolute terror in some ways of, of a conversion experience i mean i mean becoming catholic re-entering the church really did turn me inside out in, in so many ways and you know thank god for that um that that i really came to a point where where i realized i have to i have to integrate this this is this is such a, an important part of my life it's such a treasure and people are coming to me you know with all kinds of, of problems and the funny thing is is like I think if you don't have a sort of a solid spiritual foundation in your life, you'll you'll start to try to find solutions to existential problems where no solution can be found. For example, in weight loss programs. <laughs> 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 and it brings up the old St. Augustine quote, right? You know, our hearts are re- restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. And so I guess I just came to this point, Gary, where I realized, you know, how can I – how can I engage in sort of an underhanded evangelization? Because I have a lot of people who, who are following me, who look up to me, um, but they're certainly not all religious. They're absolutely not all, all Catholic. I have many spiritual but not religious people. I have many skeptics. I have many Protestants. I have some Catholics. So, so what can I do? to try and, and start an inviting conversation with people because, you know, I, I always think in my experience, you know, I, I would never have just, just wanted things just kind of, you know, foisted upon me or kind of just, yeah, sure. you know, shoved down, shoved down my throat. Um, so, you know, what I began to do was just, just gradually invite people on for, for deeper discussions on things like, like metaphysics. You know, who, you know, yeah. who isn't interested in metaphysics or virtue? Virtue is a good thing, and it's pretty neutral too when you talk about these things. But but these are these are areas of of inquiry that uh, I think if if you if you can think through them clearly, um, all point to or at least point strongly in direction of the truth of the Catholic Church. So so the the funny thing that I've realized, Gary, is if you talk about you know the the cardinal virtues uh, and things like that, people cheer, they they applaud, they love all that. 
But if you if you if you just bring up the, you know the Catholic Church, immediately everybody carries in a bunch of uh, preconceptions, prejudices, yeah. baggage, or whatever. So so I've often found that that you can talk very fruitfully about so much of what the Church teaches, the Church ideas. And when people kind of hear them in a separate context, they're incredibly receptive about meaning, morality, human destiny. And then, then it's just a, a, a little kind of a small nudge from there. Be like, oh, by the way, there's a name for all this. <laughs> <laughs> Cold Catholicism. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. You know, part of that is kind of my, I guess, my unique approach. And I'm not, I'm, it's not like I'm trying to pull something over on, on anybody. I'm really not. The idea is I feel like I found this incredible treasure that so completed my life in, in ways that nothing else ever could. And I want to share that people with people. And I want to take the, the most prudent approach in trying to foster relationships with people and try to open people up to seeing the church in the way that I now see it as this, as this great, beautiful, and true thing that you should absolutely want to, to be a part of. So, you know, how does that look like? Well, now I just have regular people. You'll, you'll be coming on, actually, fairly soon to just have those types of conversations to 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 provide an, an analysis whether in philosophy or theology or history to provide that rational foundation for uh the catholic christian worldview yeah yeah that, and that's beautiful too because well if you think about it it's basically you know sanity is where what's known corresponds to what is right and you can't be a good businessman if you're insane. You know, <laughs> if what you think reality is really isn't. You can't. You can maybe succeed a little bit in business, but ultimately it's going to fall apart. You need a foundation. Well, yeah, it's really funny because I mean it's, it's one of those things. Uh, first, of all, when I first read, you know, theology and, and, and sanity by Frank Sheed, yeah. and he kind of like builds that idea. At first, I'm like, oh, that's such a beautiful way and of putting it, and it's so obviously correct. And it, it gave a whole new meaning to my business as well because you know when I was when I was younger and I, I didn't really have things figured out, you you very much easily get caught up into all the traps of these things that you think will make you happy. Now, if I would have just read Aquinas, I wouldn't. I probably would have avoided these mistakes, but instead I had to learn through hard experience. You know, if I could just get in this good of shape, or you know, if I could just have this body fat percentage, or if I could just make this amount of money every single month, or if I could just have this cool car, then I'll be happy. And you and you run those tests, and even if you succeed, you realize actually they they don't quite cut it. They never cut it. No no finite thing can satisfy these infinite desires that we have for truth, justice, beauty, friendship, home. Um, and, and there's a reason for that, because there's, there's, there's an infinite that is meant to satisfy these desires, and that, that infinite is, is, of course, God. And, and so it, it's very practical to me in the sense that, like, I've, I've been there. I've, I've suffered from these confusions. I've made these mistakes. I know people are, are coming to me, and I want to help them in every way that I can. I want to give them the best fitness advice. I want to give them the best business advice, but I also want to help them think about these deeper existential questions as well. So that way they can have the proper orientation. And what I found is when you have the right orientation, it's not like you don't care about the other things anymore. You just care about them in a different way. Like fitness yeah. is still good. Business is still good, but it's not everything anymore, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's part of a, a larger order of things. And so, like for fitness, I mean, if you're trying to get certain results, you can blow out, you know, your muscles. You could you could hurt yourself if you're driven to certain finite goals. But you know, if it's viewed within a larger context, then you realize it's just it's it's a, a means to an end. It isn't an end in itself. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great example. You know, so many people have spent years in the fitness industry, and that's exactly what you see. They they really park their personal identity in some fitness goal, and they think that they're only valuable to the extent that they are X body fat percentage, or they do this well in, in a CrossFit competition or powerlifting competition. And they, they not only, you know, physically ruin themselves a lot of the time, but they, they drive themselves into such unnecessary pits of suffering uh, because they have a mistaken identity. You know, your value ultimately doesn't come from what you can do. It, it's inherent to what you are. Right. Being made in the image and likeness of God. And, you know, and, and I don't, 
And, and it's not like everybody who does this doesn't believe in God or, or, or they're all atheists. Or, uh, I doesn't, certainly don't want to imply that. But there's, there's a sort of lack of understanding and a lack of priority or a lack of appreciation for how much we need God in our lives to sort those issues out. And I think you, you see it manifest in so many different areas, especially in our culture, and I just see it all the time. Yeah. And the two other areas that I spend most of my time in is, is people just pursuing business, income, money, fame, power relentlessly, or, or fitness goals, or, I mean, just take your pick. And it's so funny to see how well this was analyzed by so many of the church fathers and the ch- Catholic Church in general, and it took yeah. me years to get it. So now I'm just, now I'm just trying to <laughs> help other people along. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, th- it's kind of like... Uh... You're restricting your identity down to, I'm a businessman. That's what I do. You know, I, that's what I'm good at. That's where my values are. That's, that's who I am. And then retirement comes and you disappear because that isn't you. You re- restricted yourself to this narrow band of meaning. Yeah. And that, like you said, it's like everywhere, not just there, but I mean, even like it's sexuality and, uh, you know, uh, business and, you know, everywhere. It's like, that's who I am. I am this small little thing here. And uh, once that goes, then they lose, you know, they're kind of adrift. Yeah, well, then, well, then what? Because that day of reckoning is going to come. There's, it's going to come that day when your metabolism slows down or you can't yeah. do that, that set of, you know, deadlifts like you'd be able to use to or some economic catastrophe hits. And once those things are gone... And that's been your identity. That's been your source of self-worth and self-value. I mean, what, where do you go from there? And, and that, that, of course, I think is, you know, hopefully people who land in those times of suffering uh, go through periods of, of deep introspection and, and, and start to question some of these assumptions. And, and that's largely what happened to me as well. So I think those, they can be opportunities. And they can be valuable experiences. And then often I think we have to learn through hard experience. We, you know, preferably we can also learn from the experience of, of those who've come before us. Um, but at least I've never been that smart. I usually usually have to learn through a long series of mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you and a lot of other people. Well, I can't believe the hour has flown. This has been so much fun. Pat, how can people get a hold of your podcast and other stuff? Oh, yeah, sure. So my uh, my podcast is called The Pat Flynn Show, and you can find that on iTunes or Stitcher, pretty much any of the major outlets. My primary website is chroniclesofstrength.com, and that's I, I you know blog pretty frequently there on all kinds of different subjects, from fitness to theology and philosophy, and you can find my podcast there as well and get on my email list where I share, again, a sort of smattering of tips and ideas ranging awesome. from... Well, generalist, you know, fitness, business, philosophy, anything that's kind of at the top of my mind. But uh, those would be the main places to check out. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Pleasure, Gary. Thank you. All right. That's Pat Flynn, everybody. Chroniclesofstrength.com. Check it out. And, uh, you know, coming up this week, the fun continues. We're going to have uh, Sister Mary Ann coming on tomorrow. We're going to talk about heaven. Uh, on the 24th, John DeRosa, the uh, the third part of that live broadcast, he's going to come on. We're going to talk about atheism and uh, classical theism. Uh, 25th, we're going to have Mark Maravelli talk about beauty, why it matters. And Ken Hensley is going to finish out the week. So we got a great week in store for you here on Hands-On Apologetics. And the fun continues with the Terry and Jesse show coming up next. High Impact Catholic Talk. At its best, folks. And time for me to turn off the dojo lights and shut down the Midwest Command Center. Have a great day. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic Audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic Audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. 
so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.